it's Ben. Welcome to another episode of The Tune In. Please hit that red subscribe button if you're on YouTube. If you need to get in touch with me, um, sponsorship, or you want to be a guest, you can hit me up at contact at bentyree.net. So um, all is well here. Uh, we've been rolling out these episodes. They've been going really well, received really well. Um, we are in February here in Brooklyn, New York. This will probably be out in March. I am closing the gap, the rollout gap. It used to be six weeks. Now I think we're down to four weeks. So in between taping and airing. So um, I'm not sure the exact date this will be, I believe, second week of March, something like that. Anyway, we have a really great guest, a really special musician, an amazing guitar player, Allison Yaffe. Uh, somebody that I met in New York City that I find really inspiring and uh, that I think you should know about. So I'm going to read her bio that she sent me. Allison Yaffe is a New York City-based guitarist, vocalist, and bassist by way of Kelseyville, California. An artist of wide range and depth, she earned her BM and Jazz studies with a double major of guitar and vocals at Cal State University in Sacramento. In the few years since her move to New York, she has toured the U.S. and Europe under her own name as well as with Becca Stevens, Grammy nominee J.C. Hopkins' Biggish Band, and bassist Benny Rietveld of Santana. Released her first solo album, Someone Else, featuring Cindy Blackman Santana, Ronnie Foster, Jeff Cressman, and played numerous venues with her own groups and a and with a diverse range of jazz and rock artists, including jazz trumpeter Bria Skonberg, Grammy-nominated singer Tiana Major 9, Haitian singer Darlene Deska, Don Drake Zapote, and Indian progressive rock composer Anupam Shobakar. She has opened for artists Dave Lindley and Masta Ace, been a tour assistant to David Crosby, a music, music transcriptionist for Blue Note recording artists, and teaches guitar, piano, and voice. She is currently working on her second album, solo album, which we're going to talk about amongst a lot of other things. So... Please welcome Allison Yaffe. With Rob, uh, Common and Robert Glasper. Oh, yeah. That's my neighbor. Um, Common? Robert, Robert Glasper. Wait, is he in that area still? Or is he in L.A.? No, he's, I mean, he lives, uh, he lives a few blocks away from me. I don't know if he's in L.A. I've seen, I used to see him all the time on the street with his son. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, hi, welcome. <laughs> Welcome again. Oh, thank you. To my show. Um, how are you? How's music? How's life? How's guitar? It's all challenging, but um, I'm getting by and uh, trying my best. How about you? Uh, I would say probably the same. Getting yeah. by, trying my best, um, looking for some new challenges. You know, exactly. You know, I'm like, what's next? What am I going to do? Because what I thought I was going to do, you know, yeah, became limited all of a sudden. It's not there anymore. I want to know. I yeah, I want to know about your 2020 and what you had projected. You know that that didn't come to pass. You know, what was it looking like for you? Well, honestly, I was like, I had a lot of just work in New York. So I was playing at Minton's on Saturdays. I had like a weekly brunch gig. Yeah. Um, I had a residency at the small place every Monday. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of like trying to stay home. But I was supposed to do this Arch Top Festival that Hendrickson Amps puts on in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. And yeah, Where... and me. Um, it's like, I can't remember what exact area that was in. I would have to look that flyer up. But it was supposed to be me, um, this other guitar player. It was two other Benedetto artists, because a lot of times Benedetto yeah. and Hendrickson people, they like that that setup together. So it was supposed to be Jocelyn Gould, who's a Benedetto player, Beth Marlis, wow. who works at MIT. Actually, I think she's like the, like the head, one of the heads of MIT. She was supposed to be there, and we were supposed to like do this talk together i was so excited for it but um Aww. yeah it didn't happen um 
but yeah, it was kind of just like at home stuff actually. I didn't have, normally I like try to go to Europe or do something. And I was like, I'm going to just like stay in New York, yeah, save my money, try to finish my album. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but I felt really solid. I was like, this is my first year in New York where I have like stable income where I'm doing music every day somehow. And then, um, then this happened. So that means you're officially a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> Benedetto. That's interesting. And, and Deanne, you, so you are, do you have a Benedetto? No, but are you, do you have like a partnership with them? With Benedetto? Oh no, no. With Hendrickson. With amp, Hendrickson. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Cause uh, you do, you do have a D'Angelico and it, it's, I always coupled Benedetto and D'Angelico as D'Angelico. They were kind of like the old school New York, you know, jazz box manufacturers that like the Pizzarellis would play them. And yeah. like, you know, like uh I guess Ron Afif and um mm-hmm. uh Jack Wilkins and um who else? Dave Stryker. Yeah. That's one. He plays Gibson a lot too. Yeah, yeah. And it's just interesting to see see those companies kind of have like a resurgence of interest, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah these these Hendrickson's are, are great. Yeah, I got one in I went to NAM at, in twenty twenty and I hung out at the Hendrickson booth and I was like actually just like playing Benedetto's, they were great. Mm-hmm. And um then I got to know Peter and then I wrote Peter during the pandemic and then that's when I got one of the amps nice yeah 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 yeah. they're so small yeah so um so yeah so for all of us everything changed Mm -hmm. so now it's like we kind of have somewhat of an idea of what to do (laughs) which is just nothing (laughs) well i don't know about nothing but yeah no go ahead no i mean we could I mean, there are two ways I feel like people are living their lives, to be Mm. honest. If we really, like, look, there's the people who are like, okay, we're going to just, like, work remotely, um, see people with masks, have our pod or whatever. Um, And then there are other people who are just not living that, actually, Mm. that are musicians. And um, so... I guess we do have that, but I mean, it's a risk of our health and other people's health, but right. I mean, you, you mean they're like that way. You mean they're kind of carrying on as normal and yeah, doing the bare minimum. Yeah. I've noticed that too. They're like doing how they'll play like house shows, have these big parties indoors, um, get together all the time with different people. Some people are just like living that way. So yeah. some people it hasn't, the world is different, but they're not they haven't changed you know yeah um but you know for people like us yeah it's massively different and um yeah and it keeps changing i feel like in some ways i feel like it's just getting like now the outdoor dining stuff is gone so we can't we can't play at all Really? Right. I mean, but would you really want to play outside in 30 degree weather? No, no, no. <laughs> but like for like our, you know, our fulfillment of playing music and getting yeah. that experience, it's gone for us for like a couple of months, at least a couple more months. Yeah, maybe even another year. Who knows? I mean, because we're kind of like the last tier of like, you know, essentialness. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. I feel like, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm kind of, I've always been kind of like a homebody in any way. So mm-hmm. in a way, like, I'm like, ah, stay home and not feel bad about it. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, it, but we still went out. We were still going to see people play. We right. were still playing. And so that now it's like we're just staying behind and we're not getting that fulfillment. Well, especially in the colder months, it's just like, yeah, you can't even pretend, you know, summer. I think I had like five gigs in the summer outside. They were all Mm -hmm. awesome. They're all safe. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know you had like several dozen. I don't 
know how many gigs I, I don't think I had several dozen. <laughs> yeah, it even, seemed like but... every other day it was like. <laughs> there was a moment where I was like, oh, I'm playing. This is, I'm staying here. This is great. And then it was like, goodbye. Right, but, right. Yeah. Yeah. So at least that that'll kind of come back when it gets warmer. Um, I hope so. I don't know. I had all these things I was going to do and can't do them. But it's like there's other things I can do now, <laughs> like my show and uh, working on arrangements and new things and releasing old things. And so you do some arranging. Yeah, I mean, depends on. Uh, yeah i mean yeah i can i do i mean when we were talking about doing like duet stuff it's like i would arrange that you know things like that Mm. i was when i hear arranging i always think big band oh yeah no i i i did a little bit of that in college and a little bit of that during projects i was involved in in college but like yeah not since then not really. I mean, I could do it. I yeah. could if if somebody was like, "Can you do a horn arrangement?" Actually, no, that's not true. With Burnt Sugar, I've done a couple horn arrangements for t- like oh, they'll be sick. like, okay, yeah, like uh, we went on this tour and it was like the whole tour was like playing stuff from like the jazz greats or as you know, w- yeah. several. You know, it was like we did like Wayne Shorter, um, maybe we did Coltrane, Miles Davis, and maybe even Ornette Coleman, but um. Yeah, it'd be like each person did like two arrangements and I did, I think I did Juju and something else. Yeah, my arranging skills are not good. Do you have the Don Sebesky book? No. You have to get this. Don Sebesky. Don Sebesky, the contemporary, what is it? The contemporary arranger. It's like, I have it over here. It's the best book, I'm telling you. If you want to get good at arranging I'm going to get on this. It just it just breaks down every section, how to do it. It's amazing. The mm. book is great. Don Sebesky. Because I think one of the tricky things about arranging is like not understanding different instruments, right? Mm-hmm. And like what where their limits are and how to write for them. And the keys. I mean, you can hit Sibelius and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah but. It'll do it for you. Now, now, when you were in college, you had all that stuff, right? Sibelius all the software I had Sibelius yeah Yeah. and I did take an arranging class but it was kind of a mess and so I learned pretty much nothing yeah the teacher was touring and we were trying to do like Google Hangs and this Zoom wasn't a thing it was just like not it was a complete mess yeah so I didn't get that um, education in that well, I got hip to the Sebesky book because that was the book we were using when I was in college and arranging. And it was like nobody had, you know, people didn't really have, this is like before computers. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Uh, I mean, I didn't uh, have a computer. We didn't so use you had, so software. You just like would handwrite all the arrangements. Oh, my so God. So one thing he, you know what he did? We have it so easy <laughs> He said now. your first assignment is you have to copy this Count Basie chart, like the whole yeah. score hand handwritten you have to copy the whole thing just to get get the penmanship down right i'm not mad because i i i got i got really good penmanship do you have good you oh but do you have good handwriting i i like when i write letters (laughs) no (laughs) yeah not anymore look look these are my notes these are my questions look at that it's terrible i use mine is worse it looks like a child wrote it like a (laughs) five-year-old And my handwriting is that, like, people can't read my writing. Yeah. But it was because um, I was raised Catholic. Mm. And um, the, the, well, I was, I went to Catholic school for second and third grade. And there was this one nun, and she, like, hated the way I wrote because I would use my third finger. Oh, yeah. And then so she made me write this other way. And I, ever since, it was like my handwriting was so bad. It was so weird. That is weird. And I would write that way because I was self-conscious about it. Mm. And my handwriting just never, never got good. Now, my notation longhand is way better than my handwriting. But my notation is just as bad as my handwriting. Oh, yeah. Maybe you should go back to writing the way you initially wrote. I tried. It's a tiny bit better, but it's still sloppy. Hmm. Yeah. I do wonder though. 
Yeah. I would recommend that book for sure if you're in, yeah. into getting better at arranging. Yeah, I need to get on that. It's pretty good. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of curious. How did you get into jazz? Um, uh, my first guitar teacher, his name was Jim Williams. Mm. Um, he... I, he got me into blues guitar mm -hmm. and then he gave me kind of blue and he just gave me all these albums. He gave me, um, Jeff Beck's, I can't, I named Wired, the name blow of that. By blow. Yes. Wired. Oh, he gave me Wired. Dude, that was like big for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was big for me too. Um, and then I did high school jazz band, but I like didn't know anything about jazz. Mm -hmm. And then my teacher had all these burnt CDs and he's like, no one's taking them. Like you can take them all if you want. Wow. So I was just listening to a bunch of stuff. That was when I was 15. Mm -hmm. um, and I got really into George Benson and then this Pat Metheny album, Have You Heard, live. Mm -hmm. I think that was, was it Have You Heard? Um, I think that was the song that I really liked on it was Have mm -hmm. You Heard. I can't remember if that was the album. It was a live album and that's the first track on it. So that Pat Metheny stuff got me really into him. And then uh, Joshua Redman. Yeah. He had this arrangement of yesterdays. And I didn't even like really know that many standards. And I just thought that was such a cool arrangement. Nice. Speaking of arranging. Was that like with his classic quartet? Yes. Yeah, that was that was quartet. Like Gregory Hutchinson, Aaron Goldberg. Who is the bass player? Chris Thomas? Is that his name? I don't remember who the bass player is. Joshua. I've probably seen Joshua Redman like 20 times or something. I don't know if I've seen him live. I was like obsessed with him. Like in the year 2000, I had like all their albums. Yeah, he was he was a big thing then. Did like you ever have Jazz that? Crimes? See, I didn't know that when my, my, oh, really? I had the live one from like, I think it was like Vanguard, Village Vanguard Live. I think it was a double album. And Beyond was like the big one for me. Mm -hmm. You know that record, Beyond? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. And I but saw then What them... about the one with Matheny? What's the name of that? You know, do I have that one? Yes, you do. Oh. Because it you're was... like, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> It's somewhere over here. It's just such like a album that everyone had, but I can't remember. I have to look this up. Old lady, my memory is so bad. Anyone who watches this will be like, "It's this album." <laughs> I know. We're gonna have like a what do we say before? Um, fact check. We need a fact uh, check. Wish. Wish. Did I have that? I don't know if I had that. Yeah. Cause I, I used to work at the, at Blue's Alley in DC. I was like the host. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like for like a summer. Mm hmm. And I, the kind of the only reason I wanted to do that job was, well, cause I needed a job and, <laughs> and it was like, I got to see everything and lots of it. That's so, so cool. I got to see like two runs of Josh Redman and like, like just everybody, like everybody who's anybody. I saw your teacher a lot. Mm -hmm. I saw Mark Whitfield a lot there, tons yeah. of times. Oh my god! Oh George my used god. to play there, right? I never saw him there. He was doing like more high end. Like he would be at like huge, you know, Carter yeah. Baron Amphitheater or something like that. Yeah, he was there before your time. Yeah, I mean, I think it was before he got into the pop world. You know, mm -hmm. he'd play there. Mm -hmm. But I don't ever remember him playing there. I don't think I've ever seen him play live. I don't think I've ever seen George Benson play. I haven't either. I was talking about that with Mark. I was like, I think I missed my chance. I hope I didn't, you know, mm. but no, he didn't. I think I've seen everybody else pretty much. You've seen Pat Metheny? Yeah, a lot of times. I saw Ooh. him a lot of times. I saw him, God damn, I'm trying to think. Of, I saw him do duets with Jim Hall. Oh my he gosh, did a wow. Duet record with Jim Hall, I want to yeah. say 95 ish. And I saw that and it was f amazing. It was awesome. Why um, am I not remembering that album? Did it have like strings on it? I can't. No, I think it was just duets. 
I didn't. I have to admit, I did not have the album, but I saw them, and it was like it was like one of those moments where you're like, I'm either gonna quit or I'm gonna up my game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now, the, now the, the, those moments have are so frequent that it's like. <laughs> You just like become friends with that. Like, yeah. okay, I know this place. I'm not going to quit. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned Pat Metheny and I was listening to, I was listening to your, some of your stuff. I was listening to in particular, this track called Jan. Oh, okay. You know, and it's just guitar and the tone is like so beautiful. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of Pat Metheny, just the tone but not it's like i feel like it's your own like i feel like you have your own thing which is like the reason i mm -hmm. am so interested in you as a player because a lot of players i mean don't let, let this go to your head <laughs> but i feel like a lot of players around your age kind of don't have their own thing i mean i don't know maybe i'm wrong but um i feel like you really have your own sound and i'm wondering um people used to say something similar to me like they felt like i had my own sound and i've found that that has been equally rewarding as it's been difficult to kind of like work with people and i'm wondering if you have had experiences where you felt like you had to maybe compromise your your own sound and like in favor of like a job where somebody was looking for something specific and you're like, no, I, you know, this is the way I play. Cause I, I mm. had, I had so much of that back in the day. And I guess I kind of learned to like navigate that in a way, you know, like, okay, this is what they want. I'll try to do it, you know, but I'm just curious about, about that relationship. Well, it was hard for me to do that. Um, at the beginning because I just didn't have like the technical skill to do it. Um, then over time, I'm like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and, like I'll really like study how the person sounds and like try my best at least to play that way. But um, it it's kind of complicated for me. I feel like that, that's like a very complicated question. It's, it makes me feel kind of like I'm faking something. Like it's not coming from the same place when I'm playing that way. I'm like, all right, I'm mm -hmm. just like doing this thing and I'm trying to be this thing that this person wants me to be. Sometimes it's been that. And then sometimes it's in the middle. Right. Where it's like, oh, okay. I'm like doing the style that um, in this way that I wouldn't normally do. And, but I've had so many notes from musicians as I'm sure you have too, like, oh, you got to do it this way. Can you do this? Yeah. And um, I think when people really understand you, then they like what you do. And it's right. not as much of that. Yeah. So it's kind of just finding. It just depends on the, the gig, really. But yeah, I've definitely experienced that. Yeah, it's funny because uh, <laughs> I've had so many things where it's just like, oh, no, no, no. we need you to do this exact thing. And like, you know, emulate a style. It's like really very little about me and my sound and my playing. And it's like, I used to feel so like hurt. hurt. They used to like hurt me. <laughs> Be like, ah, oh, you don't want, you don't want me. I'll just hire somebody else. But you know, it's like, I'm happy to work. So I can't, but that's most I can't of it complain. now. Yeah, it really yeah. is, right? Um, but it's funny because I, I did, I was on this session um, and it was like a big band session and uh, one of the horn players was asked to play their solo a little differently. Mm -hmm. And this is an older guy, and I'm not gonna say his name, but he's an older, older guy, um, and he got so defensive. He was like, you know what, this is just how I play. And I just, it just, everything got like weird, you know? And it was like a bad, a terrible vibe. And I just remember being like, oh, I'm never gonna be like that. I cannot be like that guy, you know? You're like, now I kind of am him. Like, it'd be like if, 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 if I had you on a session and, you know, it was like you'd take a solo and, you know, we do that take. And I was like, Allison, actually, can you go try oh it again? Oh, my God. I've, I had this right before the pandemic. The, the, I, had whole, I, I had this exact experience. Well, what I'm, I'm saying, though, in this situation, though, the guy, the leader was so sweet about it. He was just like, hey, can we go back? And I want you to try another an overdub, but like be like really aggressive, like pretend like you can't even play because like, he wanted a certain 
character, oh, right? It was okay. that. It wasn't like, I don't like what you did. Be different. It was more like, have can you try this attitude, you know? And the guy was like, no, that's just how I play. And and if you don't like it, just have somebody else do it. And like everything, <laughs> everything just got dark. And everybody was like, whoa. Um, but I have had, I had that experience though with someone just like being like, can you do this exact thing like this? I want it to sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan. And then I want it to sound like um, Grateful Dead. And that like, they just were giving me all these notes. And I don't even think they ended up using it, but I got paid, but I was just like, and and you could do, easily do all that. You're just like, yeah, I can do anything, whatever. I don't think they were happy with it. <laughs> Some people you can't make happy. And I was like, I just have to accept this. Like, okay, this is yeah. fine. Yeah, I've had lots of we really, really weird sessions like that. Okay, what's the weirdest gig? Uh, well, the uh, session, well, I'm thinking about sessions more, but mm-hmm. like something that comes to mind is somebody, I don't even want to say the producer because he's pretty yeah. well known but we don't have it, to use names. he was producing he was producing it was terrible he was producing some japanese pop artist um I, I forget what label it was for but they needed an acoustic guitar and it was like last minute and it was like the studio in my neighborhood so i was like all right i'll go and they needed me to play time after time the cindy lopper mm-hmm. song so I show up and i find out they need me to mimic this guitar part they already have down like like note for note exactly and the playing was like okay i could maybe do that but it was like it was almost like michael hedges type (laughs) comping (laughs) Uh, you know it was like solo guitar voice thing and they were doing all this crazy shit like and i'm just thinking like first of all why am i even why does why do you need to change any of this it's like perfect yeah and like i could just couldn't match it in in one take so we had to do like section by section they were getting like impatient annoyed and it was just like torture i'm just like why am i fucking here and um (laughs) they i i'm i know they didn't even end up using it i got paid but i'm just like what was the point of that that was so weird and everything was just it was just not a good vibe but whatever there's so much weirdness there are so many (laughs) weird things we do it's unbelievable yeah yeah, I have, but I'm lucky that I, w- I would say like 30 to 40% of my career has been weird as shit, sh- stuff like that. And like the other 60, 70 is like nourishing and cool and like. That's that's a good ratio. Yay. I'm getting it to that ratio, but when I moved here, it was not that ratio. Oh, and it yeah. hasn't been for a long time being mm. a female musician. Yeah, I bet. The worst, the worst things you could imagine. Those gigs are here. <laughs> yeah but i started saying no to them and um, like like specifically what i'm just like having to wear costumes and fake play and yeah being told i need to lose weight um really people mm-hmm. say shit like that yeah jesus mm-hmm. you should report all of them <laughs> oh my God. i mean that seems like that i don't know yeah wow it's I just saw such, you... a, such a weird scene that it's not even worth reporting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw you in um, something. I saw you in a play or a musical. Oh, that was um, through Classical Theater of Harlem. Yeah, that was awesome. That was really fun. Yeah, that looks. That was like something that would... I really enjoyed doing. Do you think that would continue? That show? Yeah. No, because it was supposed to happen at Lincoln Center, and it just, I don't think it was appropriate at all. Mm. Like, I think we're supposed to be doing it for kids, and it's Dionysus. Right, um, yeah. Bacchae, like, not it's, appropriate. Yes, <laughs> it was, it's, and then it was written to be even more raunchy. It's debauched, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but could, it was so fun. I could see that being somewhere, because it was so well done. It was like, god damn, this is, like, amazing production and just yeah. everything. The, they did such a good job. The staging, um the the guy who wrote the music was really cool um the whole cast the costumes like rehearsing was really fun it was it was really cool where did you guys now that was at um marcus garvey right park Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. how long was that run that was three weeks nice i think it was six days a week for three weeks nice and that was so nice just being able to 
this is my job go and play yeah. <laughs> yeah where did you guys rehearse that we first rehearsed it strangely at like where the afro latin jazz alliance office was um kind of close to where i'm living now it's like one tenth i think it was no no it was further up on the one train like off 145th mm. um and then we started rehearsing then we had like a fake like a smaller stage where we would rehearse i don't even know where that was um and so we did that for a bit and then we got to rehearse for a while mm -hmm. at marcus garvey park nice in that stage yeah yeah i love that stage did, were you in the in the like amphitheater like the yeah right yeah and then sometimes they'd have jazz concerts before right <laughs> which was cool too so they'd like jeremy pelt was there or um who else was there there were some really good musicians that played yeah they would have the uh harlem arts festival and have a lot of jazz oh, i've done a, a couple of those those are fun mm -hmm. Yeah. Who were you there with? Uh, I mean, I have a memory of Burnt Sugar, but I think I was there with somebody else too, and I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I've done a couple of those. Do you remember... Here's one for you. Do you remember the first time you performed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My parents do too. It's the first jazz band concert that I ever did. Yeah. I was like 13 and I was so nervous. I don't even think I got a note out. I was just like, <laughs> so nervous. Um, yeah. Mm. But, um, yeah, that was it. It was just like uh, the jazz band concert and then they had concert band and it was just like in the gym, I remember. Yeah. But then from there, I got more confident. What was like the first time you put something together and performed? Well, through the high school, they'd have us perform. We would do like little gigs where we'd play really easy jazz standards and then play, I think we'd play like Santana songs or Maceo Parker. When I say Santana songs, it was probably like two songs. It wasn't like a whole Santana repertoire. But then there was this battle of the bands when I was 17. So I put a group together and we played Europa Dude. and then Pass the Peas. And then we won the Battle of the Bands, and we're like, yeah, this is so cool. And then... Um, this sounds like my high school. <laughs> yeah, that was it. But it's funny because we're playing, I guess, like these metal bands. Yeah. <laughs> Just like all death metal and us playing Europa. But that was my first time just like having a blast playing. Nice. Yeah. I played Europa at my senior recital in high school. Really? Yeah. I played, yeah, Spain and Europa. Nice. Yeah, people kind of kind of went nuts at Europa. That's, shh, dude, that shit. You seen that live footage from the 70s where he would, like, hold notes for, like, forever? He still just, does that. You just get, like, shiv the shivers yeah. from it. That shit he does it to, live. Like, but in the sound check, he'll go to like where he has the most to stand. He'll and he mark marks it. it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But there's something about that. What was that record? Moon Moonflower, the live mm -hmm. album. Yeah. Oh my god, that shit used to kill me. And then there was it's a great album. There was footage from that. Yeah. That's to me. That's like peak old school Santana. Because mm -hmm. I think that's like '77 or something like that. Oh my yeah. god. I was a huge Santana fan. Mm -hmm. Saw him with Jeff Beck many, many, many times. Gosh, that must have been cool. Did they, <laughs> so they played together too? They would tour together, yeah. Uh, I, so but yeah, Jeff they would, would open. Yeah, he would, yeah, Jeff Beck would open, and then I think he would sit in, you know, he'd probably sit in on Santana's set, like at the end. Honestly, some of those are kind of a blur, but they were amazing, amazing concerts. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's like, what got, I mean, that's actually what really got me in into playing jazz that was like when i would go to those concerts yeah those were the first real concerts i'd go to santana mm -hmm. but i saw um why am i spacing out on his name the guy that plays 
Charlie Hunter. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my. I think that was my first concert of my like choosing. Mm-hmm. My parents would take. My parents took me to see Barry White. Oh shit! As a kid, and Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh my god, you got a good uh, exposure. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Barry White have like his whole orchestra. I don't remember because I was so young, but I just remember I was so sad. He was sweating so bad. He was just like could was barely sing. And he, yeah, but he had those major health issues. He ended yeah. up having a heart attack. Yeah, is that what happened to him? I, I'm not sure. I probably. Yeah. Yeah, he was not in such good shape when I saw him. When do you think it was that you saw Charlie Hunter? That was my. I think that was my sophomore year of high school or freshman year i was really young yeah so probably 2000 i think it was probably you know it might have been my junior year actually but i feel like i needed someone my parent to drive me because i didn't have my license Mm -hmm. so it was probably 2006 Mm. you just played solo nobody came i'm from a small town nobody came to that area so it was an hour drive and that was like at a community college mm. and he played solo and it was mind-blowing yeah i first heard about him in the 90s i think when i was in high school blue note was doing all these jazz r- versions of like kind of pop albums mm-hmm. and i don't charlie hunter did bob marley's natty dread album i haven't heard that oh my god that was the first and i think it was just him and a drummer Mm-hmm. And it was like, what the fuck? It was incredible. That's when we, we used to go see him. Yeah, you know Fareed Hawk? Mm-mm. He's a Chicago guy. He he uh he's a great player. He did like Crosby Stills, Nash and Young's Deja Vu album. There was like this oh. whole couple years where Blue Note was like, we're gonna do, you know, kind of instrumental versions of the all these, you know, great records, right? Mm-hmm. I feel like there was a handful of them, but those are the two that stood out. Yeah, Charlie Hunter is like, what do you, how do you even do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you messed around with the seven, it's a seven string, right? And then the flared frets, fanned frets. I'm still trying to figure out six strings. <laughs> <laughs> but did you ever like try one? I Absol- never have. So absolutely not. Forget about it. No. I know Isaiah Sharkey <laughs> was getting into that a bit. He was sounding pretty good. I did I did try to get into like, you know, because I've done a lot of work with just singers, just me and singers. And so I, I, I was inspired by him and by, oh, God. There's so many guitar players that like kind of can like do the whole bass line, chordal melody thing. Mm-hmm. And, um. So I got into that a lot, but Charlie Hunter is like a whole other level. It's like the independence is like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can't even wrap my head around it. I wonder if he does master classes or anything. I've Um, never looked that up. You know, I think he was doing, I think, didn't he do one of those Joel Harrison guitar summer, you know, about those, Mm -mm. you know, Joel Harrison, Mm -hmm. he's a guitar player. He does these alternative guitar summit have you heard of that mm-hmm. yeah so he produces those and i think it's like oh, okay these so like intensives it. upstate and i i believe charlie hunter has done they did an online one this year I right saw. yeah yeah i think i saw charlie hunter um advertised on one of those at one point mm-hmm. so yeah i think he probably does do clinics and things yeah yeah be interesting to see like how he how he started off practicing, how he got that instrument, yeah. Mm. Watch some interviews. Yeah. Yeah, you're taking me way back, thinking of all these yeah. people. <laughs> so how did you meet Cindy? I met her when I was in high school. Really? She, she gave a clinic. She gave a clinic at my high school, and then I didn't see her again until, um, you know, Lizette Santiago. She's a percussionist. She's, mm-hmm. she's great. She's awesome. Well, she she like won tickets to see Cindy and was like put on Facebook. Whoever the first person to comment can come with me. So I went to see her. 
Jeez, I don't know. Not that long ago. Maybe 10 years ago. That's the first time we actually like spoke as adults. Mm. But yeah, the thing and when she came and did the clinic was pretty cool. I told you about that, right? Yeah, where she was talking about how she has to play differently on different gigs. Oh, you did. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. mm. she because at that time she was with Lenny Kravitz, but it was like a she was giving a jazz clinic at my high school. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was cool though. It was really, really cool. That's cool. She's doing the high school circuit. Yeah, I don't know. I guess she was in town for something. Uh well not the high school circuit, but it was like a performing arts kind of prestigious. Yeah. We used, we used to have like oh, lots cool. of clinics. See, yeah, I always forget that that there's like such these levels like that school right. in Texas is a oh, college. Right. Where right. Beyonce went. It's a it's like college level. Those kids right. get out of there and they can play. Right. That's not what I had. And I know I know it's like varies for people, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it was not like that at all for me. Yeah. Yeah, high school was kind of intense for me, but I feel like I didn't really start becoming a good player until college. Mm -hmm. But it was it was a good like, you know, good for exposure, good it was a good introduction like of like here's what you got to do. <laughs> Here's what's out there and here's what you got to do. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, we had like Bela Fleck come and do a workshop and like Vic Wooten stayed behind and gave bass lessons. <laughs> it's like Did anyone play banjo? No, but you don't you don't have to. I mean, that that <laughs> vocabulary, his vocabulary yeah, no, is killing. like, oh my god. I mean, and Vic Wooten was like yeah, everybody was like had their jaw on the floor at that one. Yeah. yeah that was pretty amazing. <sighs> so who's the first I know you said Carlos, Charlie Hunter, who's like the first jazz guitarist you like really dug into, like where you were like I got to really like just obsessed with them. I was obsessed with George Benson and Pat Metheny, but my first obsession was Kurt Rosenwinkel. That's a good one. He was like God to me, like that music. <laughs> like the, but it's funny because Lily Mace is the one who told me about Kurt Rosenwinkel at a high school jazz band clinic. Right. And she um, she recommended the next step. Mm -hmm. so the, yeah, it was the next step, that trio album. And then I think he plays piano on that last track. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, he's a great pianist too. That doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. he can play. Um, but I didn't get like I transcribed the next step solo off of Deep Song. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I feel like I didn't get his technique at all. No, I didn't. You know, I didn't sit and like really analyze his lines and put it into my playing or anything. It was mm. just about listening a lot mm -hmm. and composing. But that's where I feel like I found a lot of my songwriting ideas was from listening to his music, him and Pat Metheny. Interesting. Those were my two big influences for writing. And Rebecca Martin. He played on, um, have you heard that album, The Growing Season mm -mm. by Rebecca Martin? Mm -mm. It's him, um, her husband, Larry Grenadier. Oh, yeah. There. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, she plays acoustic guitar. Brian Blade. I don't remember who plays keys on that. Is it, um, you know, because I first found out about Kurt Rosenwinkel because he was playing with Brian Blade. With the, uh, probably with John Coward, right? Yeah, and John Coward. Fellowship band. Yeah, that, yeah, that shit. That was interesting too over quarantine. John Coward would play every week at this uh, at that spot, Armana. I don't know if you oh, ever really? checked it out in the East Village. No, <laughs> no. tiny Mexican spot, like him and uh, Chris Morsey. Uh huh. They would just play there, and there'd be you know just a couple of random people eating tacos. I don't even think you could advertise at the time, so like we oh, just yeah. want to play. Yeah, yeah. Mark played with him too. It was that was really cool. I remember seeing that fellowship band in 2000 when it was Kurt Rosenwinkel. They had this album perpetual. Joni Mitchell was on that album. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, 
The one where it's like the indigenous child on the cover. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. I was, uh, but I saw them live. For I like the I like generally I feel like with jazz I like the live bet way better than the record. Um, and I was just like, this is the greatest band in the world. Yeah. Like <laughs> it was like Brian Blade. Oh my god! Like what the hell? Um, yeah. I got to hear him. Yeah, he was at Rockwood with John Coward, Steve Cardness, and I think it was maybe Ben Allison on bass. I can't remember who the bass player was. No, I don't think it was Ben. But that was a great show, too. But his energy when he's playing, he's so in the moment. Brian Blade. You just feel, yeah, yeah you feel like how present he is. Yeah, I don't even know him. And I was, it was so moving. Yeah, it it really is moving. Yeah, it really is. It's an, it's an, oh, my God. Did you ever get into the, um, the quartet he had with Wayne Shorter and, uh, I saw them live. Oh my God. Danilio Perez. Yes. John Petitucci. Yes. Oh. Do you have that record footprints live that they did? I do have that. I didn't, I didn't dig super deep into that, but that live performance I saw. Yeah. It was, yeah. That's was a, that's an album worth digging into. When that came out, I was pretty obsessed with it. You know, it was like, interesting because they're they're kind of playing free i mean they're playing mm-hmm. the tunes they're very it's but, a very free but it's thing, like yeah. they don't know what tune. they don't know the order they don't know you know some of the stuff is arranged but it's kind of just like it's very conversational and it's very raw and it's like oh my god that yeah album, that was how the performance was yeah i used to just be obsessed with that album mm. yeah i'm gonna check that I got really into Wayne for a while, actually. Yeah, I'd write, I would try to write lyrics to his tunes and really listen to him a lot. Transcribe some of the solos. Yeah. Um, that was a big influence on my writing, too. Have you ever learned his solo on Yes or No? Mm-mm. That's a good one. I think that's the only Wayne Shorter solo I've learned. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I used to love that song, Yes or No. That album, I think, is that that's on Juju. That may be my favorite Wayne Shorter album. Juju and Speak No Evil. Yeah, yeah all, all that stuff is so good. Yeah. So, you have a record coming out mm-hmm. eventually. Supposed to be April 9th. I think the date might change. But, yeah gonna come out on destiny records it's a small label uh by a couple of my friends and i just finished a music video so hopefully that'll come out next month oh yeah mm-hmm. or it would actually it would have to be two months because it needs to be a month before the album but i'll start kind of putting up teasers for that tell me about the video um it's just me playing and singing not live yeah and it's just edited nicely and um we'll have some lyrics nice like a lyric video nice it's in a graveyard which graveyard um which one is that that's very that's very goth of you (laughs) i know and i was like i'm being so emo and then the the person who was filming was like no this actually isn't emo and i was like but i want you should call your shit emo jazz (laughs) i feel like that really is a style like aaron parks did you ever get into aaron parks that album i i know i know he is though but did you you got to check out that album with him and mike morena what is that um that i found that online i found that on myspace invisible cinema myspace yes Invisible cinema is the thing, and there's a song called Nemesis that is emo jazz. I'm gonna have to check that out. I'm trying to remember what cemetery this is. The worst memory. Is it in Brooklyn? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's um, Greenwood. Yeah, Greenwood. That's the big one. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say. Yeah. When did you shoot that? I think November or October. 
It was just starting to get really cold. Mm. Nice. So it looks cool. It's simple, but I'm happy with it. Cool. What was it? How did you link up with um, Peter Carl? Um, when I was finishing my album, I had one more song I wanted to add a bunch of harmonies on it. And then he had a spot and I just went there, recorded one song. He did a good job. And then I actually, so I knew him from there. And then I recorded at Michael Brorby's place. Mm -hmm. And that's where I wanted to record. He does the positone stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, well, he my it's Michael's studio. Michael doesn't actually engineer that stuff, I don't think. And then I knew I wanted to do... It's a bit more of a jazz album than the last one, actually, except for a couple of songs. And I liked how he did stuff there, so I went, and he actually was sick at the time. I think he's getting better now, but he couldn't do most of the sessions, so Peter did it. Mm. Yeah, Peter is like, like everybody. <laughs> it's funny because like everybody's worked with him. Yeah, I can't tell you how many things I've done with him. It's it's like insane. Yeah. So yeah, another thing that makes you officially a New Yorker. Just working the, with the Peter, Peter, Carl. Peter Carl. We'll connection. have to let him know this. Does I he ever? Spoken to him in a while. Does he ever uh, uh, rattle off like what are they called? Uh, and not anagrams. What is the thing when it's like a, f a phrase that's the same forwards and backwards? A palindrome. Palindrome. Yeah. Did did he do that with you? Probably. Because like I would see him on the street and he would be like, "Hey, I got one for you," and then he like rattles it off, and that's like our conversation. I'm like, okay. "Do you remember any of them?" No, because they're like really intricate and like hard to remember. <laughs> I feel like he makes them up. It's it's nuts. Do you think they actually are palindromes? Or yeah, I'm. You'd have I'm, to fact check it. Yeah, because he can he ha he can prove it. He can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, he's great. He's great, but he has that. So when you were, so I guess he was mixing pretty much mixing your record. Mm -hmm. Was that at um the spot near me right on um. Mm -hmm. Vanderbilt and Sterling, yeah. Used to be by me too. Did you ever record when he was on Douglas with him? Mm, uh, yes, that's where I did the vocals, I think. Right. His studio. Yeah. Yeah, I recorded there, and that's where I did all the harmony stuff. Yeah, I don't know, because I know he had one place on Douglas, and then he like moved across the street. Um, I don't know what he if he's. I don't know. I don't know if he has that currently hmm. but he was at the spot in du on douglas for like decades yeah no he's at he's at borby's place yeah that's his like he it's across from um what is it called is it it's not i beam is it what's that place you know what i'm talking about where they have live music it's like right across the street i don't remember there being a venue across the street but there could be so his old place, his old, old place, there was not a venue across the street, but where he was like a couple years ago, it was like, he was like, oh, I'm at my friend's place now. There was a Probably venue. Probably Barbie. Yeah. There was a venue across the street. Hmm. I can't remember what it was called, but I used to see people I know playing there from time to time. Yeah. So I don't know. What do you think is going to be next? You're going to put this record out. Then what's the plan? Well, I have a grad school interview in a few days, so I'm just watching videos on how to do a good job in an interview. So if I get that, then I'll try to get a degree and um, hopefully we can play soon. Yeah. I think it's going to be another year. Yeah, you're probably right. I know like a lot of the institutions like Lincoln Center have put out statements because I do a lot oh, of, really yeah, i used to do a lot of stuff with lincoln center and um what did they say well you know that their this programming is suspended at least until the end of august wow could be longer 
Yeah, they I didn't sent, even hear that. Yeah, we we got a bunch of letters, you know, proof of loss of income letters earlier this year. Yeah, like a month ago. So August. <sighs> really unbelievable so it's gonna be another summer without like programming in the city you know so like mm-hmm. probably um you know celebrate brooklyn out of doors all that shit is probably not gonna happen again you don't think any la- outdoor live stuff can happen like festivals or anything not the big stuff um but what what's the thing th- there's oh, i really should research this more but there's some initiative that the city is or maybe it's the state is funding some kind of outdoor protocol-y oh, kind of things my friend was talking to me about this yeah She's trying to do some festival like when it gets when it warms up but did you ever do these make music new york concerts did you ever do any of those Mm-mm. do you know what that is so it's like on the summer solstice it's this thing make music new york where venues could partner with make music new york and you know people submit to play these gigs and you play on the street in front of these venues Mm -hmm. and some of them would pay and some of them wouldn't but like the venue had to feed you so it was like but it used to be like a big thing right um yeah but i'm I'm wondering if it's going to be kind of something like that but like Mm -hmm. more days a week which, you know, it could be something. At least it's something. I yeah. Yeah, that could be cool. I don't know. I hope so. I don't there know. was that Prospect Park boathouse All right. thing that, what is his name, Allegba was doing? Did you right. check that out? No, 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 no. But I know about it a little bit. It was fun. I, that was like one thing that kind of felt it brought like the community together. I played one. That was fun. Yeah. Nice. So hopefully more things like that. Yeah. Where is the interview? Is it NYU or Rutgers? It's Rutgers. Do you have to, it's going to be on Zoom? Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Someone was telling me if I mirror whoever's interviewing me, that makes them more comfortable. I don't think I'm going to do this. But... Mirror? Explain. So... <laughs> So I would act however, like right now, you're kind of smiling. So I would mirror your body language. I see. Yeah. So what if I'm like really critical and I'm just like. Yeah. So I'd kind of be like, yeah, so I would kind of do that too. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How does this make make you feel? I take you seriously. I'm like, I can't. I'm scared. I wouldn't want to mess with you if you were making that face. <laughs> Be like, okay. Yeah. Okay. How about you? What's next for you? I have no idea. I don't know what's next for me in like every aspect of my life. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, what are you going to do? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Because like nobody I work with is talking about anything, you know? Like, nobody is like, okay, so come September, we're going to be doing this, this, and this. It's like, I have no, I have no idea. That's yeah. Crazy. But it's good that you're kind of making some moves because, you know, it it would be, it is a good time to go back to school, I guess, you know. I promised myself I would never go back to school. But I did too. Yeah. I did too. Are you going to go back? Dude, I'm so old. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, maybe I, I'm thinking about it, but I just, you know, like, so what are you going to go back for? Jazz studies, composition? Yeah, jazz studies. Yeah. I mean, my undergrad is in jazz studies, and I'm just thinking, like, do I really want to do that? Like, what would I want to do? I was thinking about, you know, maybe I could go back for like film scoring so that it'd be like, I'm not just like reinforcing what I already do, but I'd be like completely learning something new, but still applicable and in, yeah. my, in my business, I guess. Cause I do, I have done a bit of that and I do really enjoy it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I have to think about that. 
I have to think about that. I think I think probably when I was your age would have been a better time <laughs> to go back to school. I don't know. But I, I was don't... so busy. But now it's like, yeah, now is a great time because it's like, okay. I'm like, what else am I going to do? I might as well try to do something where I'm going to maybe be able to make more money. But I have to get a scholarship to get in. I'm not going to be able to go because it's just too expensive. Either to either place. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to get a scholarship. I know NYU is not good with scholarships. so Really? We'll I see. bet you could get one. I bet you could get one. I mean, There's I... a super killing guitar player I know that didn't get a scholarship to NYU. So I'm a little doubtful, but we shall see. You know, I don't know. You could. I, th I feel like on merit alone, you could get one. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Yeah. It's tough. It's competitive, right? All these things. So do you, are you cooking at all in your quarantine? Oh, yeah, constantly. You want to talk Maybe about cooking? Let, yeah, let's let's get into this because now, <laughs> now my past couple of days, I feel like I'm, I'm stepping up my cooking game. So Yeah. So now I can maybe actually compete with you. Remember before where I challenged you and you're like, I would win. I was like, I did not say I would win. win. You said I would win. I would no. never, I would never claim to be able to win anything. Oh, I don't know. I feel like you kind of took it there, but you didn't say those words, but it was like, it was implied. I think I just said what I would do in the event it's like, of a competition. And you were it's like, like hmm. playing a chord, like the changes, like you really outlined the changes, but you didn't just like play the chord, you know, but you... <laughs> You implied it and you're playing what? without actually just like hitting the root, you know, that that's, that's the analogy I'm going to use. That's funny. <laughs> but I play just the right chord tones when I cook, you know, I'm just like, yeah, yeah I hit all the right <laughs> places. Yeah. It's funny because I don't know that I can actually cook because I just kind of, my cooking has been like making shit up and then just like a variation of like maybe five different things. Yeah, I love to just like do the same thing. So this has been following recipes pretty much, which I'm really bad at that following recipes, directions, all of that. <laughs> yeah, me too. I was I had to just keep reading it over and over. And I I had reading glasses, I lost them. So then it takes me extra long to make sure I'm doing everything right. Mm. Just like triple checking everything. And yeah, but it's, it's turned out good so far. You know, yeah, I've been, I've definitely been cooking. I need to get groceries though, but this snow, I don't, know, ugh, I don't know. This snow is hard with the pandemic. This is the oh my first God. we've done. It is, I've never been depressed by snow, but this has made me depressed. I kind of like it. It's depressing and enjoyable at the same time. But for me, uh, the thing I get the pleasure the most out of is like taking the dog on a walk oh, and right. going outside. Yeah. And with the snow, I can't go on. I, there's one path I can do. I do it once a day, but I couldn't even do it today because the snow was bad. Mm. Um, but it's just so, when it's all melted, the slush, it does something to me. Mm. I feel like uh, snow is triggering to me because the first time I ever got depressed in my life, it was in the winter and it was a blizzard. It was like one of the, it was like a historical blizzard. You remember the first day you got depressed? Well, it was like around the t around that time, yeah. Were you fifteen? I was like fifteen, sixteen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, yeah, everybody does, right? <laughs> mine was mine was pretty epic though. It almost ruined my life, but uh, you know, I got lucky. I got lucky and got out of it. So there was a blizzard. Yeah, it was like an epic blizzard. It was an epic blizzard. Yeah. I mean, it was like maybe two feet of 20 inches of snow, something like that, where like if you walk through it, it's going up to your knees. Yeah, like that's how much it was. Um, you know, and everything shut down. But at the same time, I kind of like that. It's equalizing and cozy. There's cozy potential there. Like you're just like, I don't have well, to go out. It's, I'll just... But that's what we're in. So I think. <laughs> That's why it's so depressing because I'm like, it's like another we're already in the cozy. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now I'm like, I can't do anything. Can't right. even go on a walk. You really can't do anything. Which is how you guys probably felt around April. Because you weren't here in, in April, huh? I was not. So you left in, in you left in March 
I left March 13th. And then when did you come back? After the 4th of July. Okay. Yeah. So you were gone for the worst of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The worst of it was pretty bad. It was pretty, it was pretty intense. Traumatizing even, you know? Yeah. I was talking it's to just those numbers. Just well, it's just kept... not even that. It's just like, even what you're experiencing, you know, seeing ambulance ambulances double parked on your block like several times a day and hearing them all day all day and at night for weeks and weeks oh and, my God. and you know knowing what that is it's like holy shit this is crazy but at the same time it was like i couldn't see myself just like leaving i don't know i felt like oh i gotta be here for my community you know i don't even know how but you know, I, I don't know. It was, it was a really weird time. Yeah, really I ran away. Time. No, good. I mean, shit. Good. But you also had that situation where you were just like, yeah, I don't want to be here anymore. Yeah. Right? In that apartment. I lost all my work and I was just like, I can't. I don't want to be here. Yeah. So I um, got on a plane as quickly as possible with my dog and my guitar. Yeah. and went to my mom's it was really nice being at my mom's just in the woods mm. um she has a creek and stuff mm. so i could just walk outside it felt i felt pretty i felt pretty good at first i mean i was sad and i was paranoid but um it was okay at first yeah. and then it kind of like i felt relatively okay through most of the year not for yeah. the state of the world, but just for my mental health. You mean when you came back? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I had missed it all. People, you know, it seems like a flow was happening here. Yeah. And then, yeah, I just feel like the winter. I feel like this has been pretty brutal. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But could be worse and seems like cases are more under control at this time we'll see though he's he's uh cuomo is reopening indoor dining on valentine's day so that could be really bad <laughs> mm. you know we could see come march another spike because mm -hmm. but i think the like restaurant associations my, my dad I was talking to my dad today and he's like yeah i think it's because the restaurant association sued sued him or something so there's like all this pressure of like, so well, he has to, there's like public health and, you know, all these shutdowns, you know, and different tiered shutdowns all for the past year. And then businesses are like, dude, really? Like you want to ha even have an, a, an economy at all? I don't know. I won't be going into a restaurant anytime soon. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like as t as tough as um as tough as it was in the spring um and I don't know if this is good or bad but I feel like it made me like way way more sensitive and tuned into people which I already kind of was but like <laughs> but like a, it's like at a new level. You it's mean like, like in person experiences being All of in it. Tune? All of it. Like I'll just yeah. like get these weird spidey senses of like I got to text this person and then they'll be like, Oh my God, I can't believe you text me right now. I'm having like the worst time. And like, can you talk? And oh. I'm like, yes. <laughs> mm. Like, it's like weird, but, um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I've had that with some friend. Like I have that with one friend. She always texts me like when something, she just knows, like, she yeah. knows what I'm going through and like the things I'm dealing with. And she always texts me like, when I'm in the middle of something or I'm like feeling really sad about something. She just always like texts me at that right time. It's just so interesting how that happens. I have one friend like that. When, when it's like at the worst for me, she's like, Hey, yeah. <laughs> what's up? I'm like, dude, how'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. It's good. It's good to have good friends. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, like what, what's on your bucket list? Like if you, all things being equal, let's say no pandemic, you know, sky's the limit. What would you want to be pouring yourself into? Like, I know you're doing the record. 
But like beyond that. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's just hard because I'm also, I'm trying to think differently than I was before. Cause before I would manifest things a lot and like a lot of things would happen. But then I'm like, what am I manifesting this for? Mm. You know, I'm trying to figure out like, I want to be a better musician by doing these things every day. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, I really want to write, just like keep writing more and just making albums that are more and more cohesive. Because mm -hmm. I feel like this one's a little bit closer, but it's still, I still am always balancing this thing of like jazz guitar and singer songwriter. Mm. I'm trying to like really bring that, bring that all together. Um, and I do kind of want to experiment with some like different, some different styles than I normally do, or just like a different way of um, having my music played than before. Yeah. But I want to tour. Like I miss, I miss playing. Not that I was like, I wasn't touring a ton. I did some touring in 2017, 2018. Your stuff? In 2018, it was mine. Mm -hmm. Then the other one before it was with Becca Stevens. Right. She's, dude, she's like phenomenal. She really is phenomenal. <laughs> she's like. She's really brilliant. Yeah. She was such a huge influence on me. Yeah. I would not be writing you know, if it wasn't for her. She's, she's an amazing, amazing musician. Yeah, she really is. Yeah. But those are kind of the things I would want to tour with a band of my choosing or I mean before I was like I just want like some kind of cushy gig I'm still like that yeah yeah I mean then that could be cool because it can it can give you a solid foundation to kind of do whatever you want really yeah you know? yeah but now I don't know if I'm as set on that thought as I used to be yeah I mean I could kind of see you fitting in kind of anywhere really um, and I've I've always kind of tried to be that kind of person. I've sought out many, many, many cushy gigs, <laughs> had some for a time being, lost them, auditioned yeah. for other things. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of just like, yeah, I mean, it's always, it would be great to see you touring on your own stuff for sure. Like, I'm sure that would be very fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, but you're one of these players I could almost see you in like any situation just being like, yeah, I do this too, whatever. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I play with this like uh, pop band that you grew up listening to and this metal band. I don't know, you know, who knows? What about you? What do you see for this year? You know... I started doing this show and I have, I have no expectations about it. Like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with it. I just really do like, I really like talking to people and I like, um, I like trying to find different angles and like getting things to come out of people that I feel like will be helpful for other people to hear, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't necessarily see that as being like a potential for like, you know, an, like an employment thing, you know, who knows yeah. as far as, you know, I want to, you know, I want to be recording and touring and, and all that. And I, I don't even care with who, I mean, as long as it's cool, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, as far as like what's next for me, it's like, I feel like I want to do duet stuff with you. I had an idea of, um, doing another singer songwriter record, but like kind of like more of an ambient kind of thing with just electric guitar kind of like, I'm feeling that I don't really know what that's going to be, but I'm like feeling that like, Oh, that could be. Yeah. A thing. Um, but then, you know, I had this group, I had this trio that we were going to really be pushing hard in 2020 and then we weren't able to. And like, I feel like there's still potential in that. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's all these singer songwriters I was working with before and Burnt Sugar was like Burnt Sugar was so was going to be so active in 2020. Damn. And like the it was getting higher end and higher end like it was like we had 
built up to this point where things were getting really great. And so I don't know. I just want to be able to stay here and play guitar and practice guitar and get yeah. better and get better and like do awesome shit with awesome people. And what that looks like, I'm totally wide open to. Yeah. <laughs> I feel you. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. That's my only agenda. I gotta be playing all the time, growing, nourished, nourishing others. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. So where do you like people to go to check your music out? Do you like people to go to Bandcamp? Bandcamp is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. My music's on Bandcamp. Um, I mean, it's on iTunes and all that, but the money goes yeah. to me if you buy it on Bandcamp. Yeah. We try to only promote Bandcamp on this show. <laughs> Yeah, we only do band camps. There's no such thing as anything else. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah, it's it is the best. I mean, it is the best thing mm -hmm. out there. Um, it's funny, you know, John Medeski. You know who he is? I don't personally know him, but, but yeah. I mean, you know who he is. Mm -hmm. He was talking about, um, you know, this idea of like people just not supporting the arts. Um, it's kind of a remnant of a time when people thought, well, what you're really supporting is this huge conglomerate that's evil. And like, so, you know, basically that kind of turned people off to yeah, it did. supporting recorded music. And it was kind of heading that way anyway. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. And I think like us being very vocal about something like Bandcamp is important for the consumer to know, like, this is actually a way to support the arts yeah you know like spotify does not support the arts like you know listening to some shit on youtube does not support the arts yeah um so yeah i tried only like on this show Bandcamp. it's all about Bandcamp. <laughs> and do you have a website yeah but it's a it's like a sonic bids website but you could go to alisonyaffy.com and it'll cool. come up Mm -hmm. nice sonic bids Man, you're like old school sonic bids yeah instagram that's kind of what i treat as a website almost you so. post a lot of amazing you've actually inspired me to up my instagram game because you post all these like you'll be like working on a solo and you'll put a video up and i'm like man i bet that's like a really good way to engage with mm -hmm. fans and stuff it is yeah. yeah have you ever gotten gigs from that in the before times um brad why do i always call him brad miller i cannot believe i'm spacing out his name is not brad miller he's an amazing guitar player well bob lanzetti hooked me up mm -hmm. because of hearing me with that classical theater mm -hmm. gig mm -hmm. brad brad allen williams do you know him no i don't he plays with Brittany howard oh yeah okay he heard me play on there and then he recommended me for this FIVO session with Tiana Major 9, this right. artist. Right. So that that's all because of Instagram. Yeah. I'm, I, that's how some people have only heard me through Instagram. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I'm going to up my Instagram game. The Tiana Major 9 thing, um, was that like the first kind of thing like that you've done? It mm -hmm. was like now did you record with her or you just did the vi that video we just recorded that video that day it was like a live performance so that's live yeah mm -hmm. oh my god there's I... a there's a click and then there's some harmonies uh -huh. that are like in it so we have to be like in time with it or whatever but so we rehearsed it that way i love so we have a click yeah i love this the like solo you guys do that she sings with you yeah that's i guess that's did, a did you solo. did you write that or she i did that? not write that solo yeah. that i don't know who that i was trying to figure out who that guitar player was i don't know who it is so that's pretty cool that's a pretty cool yeah yeah that's a great and then she got nominated for a grammy too on the other song oh nice so that's really cool not on the one i'm playing but yeah. her own yeah so I that was fun i kind of miss doing I kind of miss that potential for like doing high end stuff like that stuff is can be really inspiring because you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, this is how it feels. It yeah. can be like this or it can be like that. Mm -hmm. But it's it can also be so fleeting because it's like one day you're like on a plane getting ready to do a show, a TV show or whatever. And then the next day you're like, you know, back to back to where you started. <laughs>
Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's what happened with that PA thing when I was doing the Cros. Oh yeah. David Crosby thing. But I got I was so stressed. I thought he was going to die. Oh. And I would be resp- would be responsible for him. I got so sick at the end. Oh. I was like, okay. I don't think I can do this anymore. Then I just was like, oh, I'm going to do it and then it ended up not happening. They just got someone else. But I was like, that's kind of a blessing. But it was fun. It was fun to see that music every night. And Is that when he was had snarky puppy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Michael League. That album he did with them was really interesting. It's so good. Kind of made me interested in him again, you know? Like, I've yeah. always been a fan, but I'm like, wow, he's really trying to do different shit. It's, it's cool. Have you he seen... has another album before that too. That's really good. Yeah. His son. Have you heard the story about his son? Did I it, tell you about that? I know the story for sure. Like he had, he, I guess he didn't know he had a son and then he. His son found him. Right. Right. I don't know how many years later. Right. Um, and he was, he's this amazing uh, piano player, arranger. He's a great musician. That's awesome. Just like in his genes. That's amazing. Yeah. And so they play music together. It's really good. David Crosby is very, well, at least he comes off this way when I see him on things. Very lucid and thoughtful considering all the drugs he's done. <laughs> Massive amounts he, of it's it like you know. He is so sharp. Yeah. Like, it's he is so, he appears like an old man but like inside he yeah. is so young and youthful and his eyes like oh. they tell such a story it's he's you can just tell he's so young and like free spirited still have you seen but that? he's just in this body uh, it's mm. i've never experienced someone like that and what he put that body through it's like oh my god i mean yep um have you seen that movie echo in the canyon no it's about uh what is that canyon in la um that everyone lived in in the 60s i know what you're talking about yeah. not echo canyon yeah i don't know i well i wouldn't know the name but yeah he's amazing in that just his interviews he's just so thoughtful and impeccable and oh you know what? i'm thinking of the they lived in like this house in the bay area that's what I'm thinking of, where like Bob Dylan would go hang out and Joni and. I think you're thinking. Are you sure in the Bay Area? Because maybe it wasn't in the Bay then. Because that area, um, Laurel Canyon. Mm, that's was it. Yeah. In 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 L. A. County, and it's where they all li- li- lived. That was it. Yeah, and hung out. Yeah, that's a great. It's on Netflix. Echo in the Canyon. I think you'd like it. I have to watch that. Um, and then he has this thing on Rolling Stone has these ask dave crosby series have you seen that no (laughs) you have to see it's on youtube it's like people send him questions and there's like all kinds of random shit and he gives advice and it's actually really really cool like he actually gives really great advice yeah i'll see if i can find one a good one and send it to you Hmm. well thank you for doing this Thank you for having me. Of course. It was really fun. Of course. I had to have you. There's and I hope you of... keep it up. You think you think I should? I think you should. Cool. I'm going to. I'm definitely going to. Yeah. I'm sorry. You were about to say something and then I interrupted. What was I going to say? I don't know. Oh, I I was going to say I have to I had to have you on here cuz you're like my favorite guitar player. No. <laughs> one of my favorite guitar players like of like my age and younger yeah for mm-hmm. sure Thank for sure so just for the record but i'm never gonna say it again because it's okay. gonna go to your head oh i'll, I'll just record <laughs> this moment right now you can't edit this part out <laughs> right if anything only post that yeah cool all right well all right, we'll talk ben. soon thank you we'll talk soon thank you all right bye All right. That was awesome. I enjoyed that conversation a lot. Um, Thanks for checking this out. Check out Allison Yaffe. Go to her website. Go to her band camp. Um, Again, thanks for tuning into the TuneIn. You can subscribe on YouTube. Contact bentyree.net if you'd like to get in touch for any reason. Um, I'm going to stop announcing the donation things because honestly, I feel it's kind of tacky. Even though a lot of people do it, um, you, you can donate 
my handle is Ben Tyree on all the, uh, you know, on all the services. I'll post them in the description, but I'm not going to post them anymore. Um, cause you know, what's the point anyway, <laughs> I've enjoyed making these. Um, I hope you're enjoying watching these and, uh, stay in touch and see you next time. Peace. Mm -hmm.